welcome to the Independent Bible Church in Duryea, and thank you for attending our Easter Sunday uh, service. Uh, we're thankful that the Lord has given us this opportunity to be with you through this medium, and we trust that it will be a great blessing to you. Uh, we're going to begin with a word of prayer, and then Shane is going to come and lead us in a congregational song. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the time that you've given to us. Thank you so much for what you've done for us on this day. Uh, we look to you, Lord, that you will bless as we open the word of God, that as we try to sing uh, in this venue, that you will give us the ability within our own living rooms, bedrooms, or offices, wherever we might be, uh, and help us, Lord, just to rejoice together over the resurrection of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If there's one that needs Christ as Savior today, we pray that you will help them to understand the gospel message and that they might receive the Lord Jesus as their Savior. And we'll thank you for that. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Shane? All right. Good morning this Easter morning. He is risen and he is risen indeed. We're going to start off by singing Christ the Lord is risen today. If you have your Majesty Hymn Book at home and like to follow along, that's 273. We're going to sing the first and last stanzas of Christ the Lord is risen today. sepulchre, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them, and they found the stone rolled from the sepulchre, and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus, and it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout. Behold, two men stood by them in shining garments, and as they were afraid, bowed down their faces to the earth and said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember, he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crushed, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words and turned from the sepulcher and told all these things unto the eleven and to all the rest. Christ the Lord this day is risen indeed. Now, next we're going to sing yet another hymn, familiar one, He Lives. And that's going to be, if you have your Majesty songbook, hymn number 268. And we're going to sing the first and last stanza, He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. I serve a risen Savior, He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say, I see. Just the 
someone to run to the store for you, especially if you're elderly, uh, you need help uh, picking up medications, uh, please let us know that, uh, and uh, we'll try to make arrangements to uh, give you some aid uh, in this particular area. So uh, we just trust that you're, you're, uh, you're doing what you're supposed to do, uh, and by God's grace, we'll get through this. Don't be panicky. Uh, just trust the Lord for all these things. Uh, isn't it great to be saved? Isn't it great to know where you're going to spend eternity? In a time like this, the world needs people like you to be witnessing to them and telling them about the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we're the ones that have hope because we have a great hope in our Lord, and we trust that uh, you will be sharing that uh, to each and every individual that is, uh, comes in contact with you, whether it's a UPS driver or whether it's somebody that is a stranger. Uh, just to give them the gospel. Maybe it's a relative and they need Christ. They have no assurance, uh, and so we need to give them that assurance. You know, uh, the, the mask that they want everybody to wear, uh, that is a very paper-thin uh, piece of apparatus that uh, may or may not work, uh, but our Lord Jesus Christ works for our soul, so give him the glory and uh, be, be usable in his hands at this time. Uh, we don't know how long this is going to take place, This, uh, particularly in Luzerne County of Pennsylvania, or one of the highest uh, counties by way of count of people that are infected, and I know that that uh, is uh, basically localized in one community more than others, but still it affects the entire county. Uh, and so we don't know what the governor is going to do, we don't know how this is going to all end up in the next two weeks. Uh, but it really does seem like it's been an eternity which, since we've been in church together. <clears throat> Shane just showed me a bulletin. It's been a month uh, that we have been doing this now, a month since our last service uh, that we were all together. And uh, it, it seems like it's longer than that. Uh, we don't want it to go on much longer, but we also want to protect everybody uh, from catching the virus. And the bulletin that I sent out, I, I made mention once again of the of the Spanish flu. And uh, I'm gonna ask you if you have the capability, go read about that a little bit. Uh, they didn't have all of the resources that we have today. Uh, they didn't shut down the country. Uh, and there was a huge cost uh, to that flu and it was absolutely awful when it took place. And so we, uh, we don't want that to happen again either. Uh, 
We want you to pray for brethren around the world, um, missionaries that are on the foreign field. Uh, they're incapable of doing what is necessary. We got a note my wife read just today of, of one of our missionaries who couldn't go back to the field because that field is not allowing any people to come back in uh, to it. And so there are ministries everywhere, whether they're small or whether they're large, uh, that are uh, suffering some to a greater degree than others. But remember our missionaries in prayer. They are going through this just like we are. Uh, our missionaries in the month of the Conrads in Hong Kong. And uh, they have been dealing with this a lot longer than we have been dealing with it. And they have reverted to Facebook and to other things in order to have their Bible studies, in order to have their church services. So please keep them in prayer, if you will. Uh, that's it by way of uh, any announcements. I, I don't have any more uh, to give you because we're going day by day, week by week, and we're listening to the news just like everybody else. Do you have anything else, Shane? Okay. We're going to take our Bibles, if you will, and look at Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 11. Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 11. Of course, we want to deal with the resurrection today. Today is the day that we focus on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, we're glad to be able to do that. You know, the, the Word of God, especially the book of Acts, is uh, ripe with uh, the resurrection message. Uh, we're not going to the book of Acts uh, as our text. We're going, coming here to, to Mark chapter 16. Look at verse number 9, if you will. Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them uh, that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. After that he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked, and went into the country, that's verse 12, and uh, they went and told it to the, uh, to the residue, neither believed they them. Sorry, I went two verses further. The resurrection of Christ is of no small consequence to you and I, uh, to men everywhere, and yet men hold this great historical event in derision, and many deem it only to be a fable. Certainly we can see that in verse number 11 of our text, and then in verse number 13 of our text, that man, even when the event had happened, didn't believe. Now today, especially prior to 1950, the common view of the resurrection of Christ amongst those that would consider themselves to be of a liberal persuasion was that since it could not be, that is the resurrection, could not be substantiated by present miraculous works, it must be dismissed as delusional thoughts of a few disciples. Uh, that is uh, bringing men to a position, especially pastors who believe that, it's bringing men into a position where they have nothing to offer to a lost and dying world. Since 19, the 1960s, however, an interesting thing has happened, even amongst the liberal theologians who have reconsidered the resurrection and they've reversed themselves to some degree. The power of the resurrection, however, is not because somebody has a theory about the resurrection, but because somebody has life in the resurrected Christ and they know King Jesus by faith. We understand these things not because we have a knowledge of the history of something, but we have taken that history and we believed it and it's changed our lives. Now there are some with varying uh, theories concerning what it is, what the resurrection is, they don't all come up to what the Bible has to say. So we're going to use a lot of Bible references this morning. 
Uh, it's going to be more of a Bible study so that you can have some notes at your disposal in the day that we live in. And you can know what God has to say about the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. Let's have a word of prayer as we begin. Father, thank you for this time together. We pray that thou would minister to our hearts the word of God. And that as we do that, my God, that you would be glorified, that Christ would be lifted up, and that men might believe on him to the saving of their soul. Well, thank you for that help. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's deal with the first point I want to give to you today, and that is that Jesus Christ actually died. Say, so, well, that's, that's a given. Well, no, there are some people that don't believe that Jesus actually died. Many deny the resurrection, also deny the, the uh, death of Christ. For example, <clears throat> Islam, while they acknowledge that Jesus Christ rose to heaven, deny that he was crucified. So let's take a look at this. Let's understand it just a little bit. That Christ actually died is explained from facts of the word of God. First of all, the soldiers pierced the side of Christ while he was on the cross. Do you remember that? Blood and water came pouring out, the scripture says. In John 19, verses 33 to 37, it says, But when they came to Jesus, that would be the soldiers, that would be the guards. When they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they broke not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out water, and a blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that, uh, that he saith true, that he might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled, a bone of him shall not be broken. And again another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. So here we have the, the soldiers that are there. They look at him, and he's dead already. And so to make sure, they pierce his side, and out comes the blood and water. And there's a whole study that has been done on that. Uh, and we don't have time to go into that, but I would recommend that you might want to take a look at a doctor's account of the crucifixion of Christ. Secondly, not only did the soldiers pierce his side and not break his legs, but also he was pronounced dead and Joseph of Arimathea asked for his body in order to bury him naturally. Matthew 27, verses 57 to 58. When the evening was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple and went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. And then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. Why would you bury somebody who is alive? Jesus Christ, the dead on the cross, soldiers pierce his side, blood and water come out. Joseph of Arimathea now comes and claims the body, asking Pilate if he can go and bury him. In the process of all of this, according to Mark chapter 15, verses 44 through 45, we find that a Roman centurion was dispatched in order to get the body off the cross so Joseph could go and bury it. In Mark 15, 44 to 45, it says, and Pilate marveled if, it were, if he were already dead. And calling unto him the centurion, he asked him whether he had been any while dead. And when he knew of it, this, uh, knew it of the centurion, in other words, the centurion is giving evidence to Pilate that Christ has already died. When he knew it of the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. So we have a little bit of the historical fact there and a chain of events that is taking place. Now, they, Joseph takes the body and now enter into the scene the women, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome, who prepared his body for burial quickly. 
Mark chapter 16 and verse number 1. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him, which was the custom of the particular day. They would not anoint a body that was alive. But here it is, Christ's body, and they're going to anoint it. Now the soldiers who were standing guard at the cross saw no need to break his legs once again, for he was dead already, and that's in John chapter 19, verse 32 to 33, another account of a, of a scripture that we've already read. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other. Remember the two, two uh, thieves on either side of Christ? They were crucified with him, but when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was dead already, and they broke not his legs. So we have five testimonies given to us of the very fact that Jesus Christ was dead. But here's the one I like most of all. We have the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. After he was resurrected, after he uh, is in heaven, and as he gives testimony to the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos, that he was dead. Here it is, Revelation 1.18. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of death and of hell. I am he that liveth and was dead. Imagine that. Here he is, the resurrected Lord, giving testimony that he had died. All right, so we have this very fact. Jesus Christ died at Calvary. God did not die we find that Christ died. I don't understand it all. Don't you try to understand it all. It's just accepted by faith. But Christ, who is God of very God, in a human body, died at Calvary's cross and was buried in a tomb. His body then, being buried in a tomb, which was the normal thing, and the, and the tomb, if you, if you can envision it in your mind, was hewn out of a stone, Joseph of Arimathea's stone, it was hollowed out, and it would be a chamber with a door in it that you would have to stoop down to go through. There would be a little window off to the side uh, to allow the decomposing stench of bodies to exit that. There would be a place where you could go in, and the, and the body would be laid off to your right. And there would be another place where they would put the little boxes where the bones after one year would be gathered, and they would put the bones in there. Well, his body that was placed right beneath the window and to the right of the door as you would go into the tomb. The body was sealed by that stone and there would be a trough to roll that stone in its place and seal it. That trough, that place, that grave is where his body was placed. Listen to many of the references of scripture again. But let me tell you this before I go to the Bible, that many believe in a spiritual resurrection or some sort of reuniting of his spirit with his body, which lived on earth again. Some would say that the Lord Jesus Christ wasn't dead, but he simply fainted because of all of the stress of the cross. And that when they put him in the tomb, this wounded, beaten, crucified body revived. Well, I would like to see any of the individuals who believe in that theory, if they believe that you could be wounded that badly and have a spear stuck up into your side, which would have reached up into your rib cage, hence water and blood coming out, I would like to see them go into a cold tomb and revive. No medical attention being given. See, it just doesn't make sense. But here's what the scripture has to say. Matthew 28 and verse number 6. He is not here, for he is risen as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. That message was given by an angelic being unto the women that came to anoint the body. He's not here. He is risen as he said. 
and they invited them in to see where the Lord had laid. In Mark 16, 6, it says, And he said unto them, Be not affrighted. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, with, with Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. Luke chapter 24 and verse number 3. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. Verse number 12 of chapter 24. Then arose Peter and ran unto the sepulcher, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves and departed, wondering in himself at that which had come to pass. So here is Peter scratching his head. John chapter 20 and verses 1 and 2. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciples whom Jesus loved and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Confusion? Disbelief? How does this happen? Well, we're dealing with God. Anything is possible with God. Do you remember the events of the virgin birth? Questioning, Mary says, how could this be? All things are possible with God. Don't you think that a God who's spoken to existence, the entire universe, and all the galaxies that are out there, including this old world that we live on, what, what consequence would it be? How much power would it take to rise, raise a body from the dead? Oh, there's a day coming when all of us are going to join him in, the res in a resurrection. It is Jesus who said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Yes, he rose again. But not only do we find those scripture references, but we find that there were witnesses of the resurrection. The women mentioned, whom I just said and just read about, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and of course Salome. And when they were coming, they were coming to anoint the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to what the scripture has to say. Mark 16, 2 to 6. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrightened. And he saith unto them, Be not affrightened. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they have laid him. So... Here again, the, the, the ladies are witnessing the fact given the testimony of the angelic being. You remember Peter didn't believe at first? The disciples, Peter and John, whom the women told about the empty tomb, are recorded doing this in John's Gospel, chapter 20, verses 4 to 8. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulcher. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter, following him, and went into the sepulcher, and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and he believed. That's John, by the way. Notes the order that is going on here. They didn't believe. They're told of the ladies. They still don't believe. They go to see for themselves. They stop at the door. Peter stoops down. He enters in. John is still stooping at the door. He can't see around the corner. Now he enters in. What do they see? Linen clothes. 
neatly folded. A napkin that was about his head, neatly folded and lying in a place. Oh, it's all available right there in the tomb. He could rise again and he could lay aside his garments on the next place for a body to lay. It's all available. Now they believe. And yet there are some that don't believe. And by the way, the neatness of the tomb speaks against the body being stolen. Remember, there are guards. If the body was stolen away, they would have had to dispatch the guards. They would have had to roll away the stone. And unless the guards wake up, unless the guards come back to consciousness, they've got to hurry to steal the body away. Nobody is going to take time to fold up the grave clothes. I could see them that they would be either taken or they would be laid there in a heap. Let me ask you young people this morning, did you make your bed? Maybe you got up late for Sunday school. Did you make your bed? Oh, maybe since you've been home you haven't made it in a week. Nobody's breaking into your house. And still the sheets that you wrap yourself in every night are not put away and they are not neat. And there's nobody stealing you away. I marvel that the Lord Jesus Christ took the time to do that for us. And it speaks volumes of the fact that he rose again. Thirdly, the angels that were there, they testified of a risen Lord. We've heard from them in two occasions now, but listen to Matthew 28, verses 5 and 6. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay one more time. Over and over and over again, we have the historical accounts in the gospel. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. He is not here. He is risen. And then, of course, we come back to those Roman guards again. Their life is on the line. They didn't do what they were supposed to do. Well, how could they? How could they stop God from doing what God is going to do? But they did give a testimony. In Matthew 28, verses 2 to 4. And behold, there was a great earthquake, the scripture says. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven. So this is not a normal earthquake like we record earthquakes. This was very specialized, localized in the garden. There was an earthquake for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven. And came, up, uh, came and rolled back the stone from the door. And sat upon it. Can you imagine the audacity of that angel? He comes, he shakes the place where it's at. He rolls back the stone and he sits upon the stone. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And these guards saw that angel. Here's what it says. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and become as dead men. Well, I think I probably would too, wouldn't you? If I saw an angelic being whose countenance was like lightning, and there was this localized, specialized earthquake, and I watch him roll away the stone and sit on it, and in my mind's imagination, I see him just turning and staring at the guards. Like, got anything to ask me, boys? Wow. Matthew 28, 11 to 15 says it this way. Now, now when they were, uh, of another occasion of our blessed Lord. Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came to the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. In other words, they've got nothing to guard anymore. The tomb is empty. And so they go from their place 
and they go to Jerusalem. They go from the garden tomb and they go down to Jerusalem and there they're going to go to the chief priests. They're going to go into the temple. And when they were assembled they el with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money to the soldiers. So that last phrase in verse 11, and they showed unto the chief priests all things that were done. What did they tell them? Well, we were guarding the tomb. Uh, we were all awake. And there was this earthquake that was happening. And then all of a sudden we looked and there was this angel and he was rolling away the stone and he looked like lightning and he was uh, garments on like white as snow. And then he sat on the stone that was rolled away and the tomb is empty. These are Roman soldiers. They're not making this up. Their life is on the line. And so when they had said all of that, they gave the money, money, bribery money to the soldiers. And the chief priest said, say, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we, went, while we slept. Do you know that if the Roman soldiers were asleep on that night, they should have been executed? I don't know how many of you have been in the military and have been on guard duty. If you were on guard duty during a very terrible time, maybe of war, and you allowed somebody to do something that they weren't, that you were guarding to, to that thing, whatever it was, then you're going to have to pay with your life because you're a traitor. Here are the Roman soldiers. Are they readily going to come and say, listen, we were asleep? I don't think so. The chief priest said, if it comes to the governor's ears, we'll persuade him and secure you. Don't worry about it. We're going to take care of you, boys. And they took the money, it says in verse 15, and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported on to Jews until this day. Next thing I want to say to you is that after his resurrection, he was, res he was recognized since he had the same body that he had prior to the resurrection. It even bore the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ, of the cross that our Lord suffered there at Calvary. John 20, 27. Then said he to Thomas, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless, but believing. So here he is. The prints in his hand, the hole in his side, the marks in his feet. Here he is. And he says to Thomas, doubting Thomas, reach here, put your finger in, reach here, put your hand in. Wow. And I want you to note the record of his appearances after the resurrection. Matthew 28, 9 says, And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. And in verse 10, Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go and tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. John 20, verses 14 to 18. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. And Jesus said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said unto her, Mary, and she turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni which is to say, Master. And Jesus said unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. In Mark chapter 16 and verse number 9 now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And if you take the time sometime today 
to look at Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 22, you will find the account of two disciples on the road to Emmaus and Jesus coming into their midst and Christ telling everything about himself from the Old Testament. And then as he were to, would be departing, they were sitting down, they started a fire, they were going to have some supper. They invited him to stay with them and then he revealed himself to them and then disappeared out of their midst. They said, while he yet spake with us, did not our heart burn within us? And so we find that, yes, he resurrected. And so there were many people that saw him. As a matter of fact, if we had the time, we could go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And there it would tell us that he appeared to over 500 individuals at once. This resurrection. As I said in the beginning of the message, some people think that it is simply a spiritual resurrection some people think that the body was stolen away that he never resurrected at all well what about the body of the Lord Jesus Christ what is the nature of Jesus resurrected body well first of all let me say to you that it's composed of flesh and bone Luke 24 39 says Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. And John 20, 20, and when, they had, when he had so said, they, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. So here he is, he said, handle me, touch me. A spirit does not have flesh and bones. So he still bore the marks of the crucifixion. I've said that about two or three times. Remember in John's gospel, let me say it one more time. Chapter 20, verse 29, uh, verse 27 through 29, but particularly verse 27. He saith unto Thomas, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands. What was Thomas looking at? Was he looking at a vision? No, he was looking at the literal hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. Reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side. Was he looking at a vision when he saw his side? No, he's looking at a literal side. Be not faithless, but believe me. So it's composed of flesh and bone. And yet it was not an ordinary body. Now this is something that is beyond our comprehension, I think. Here he is, he's composed of flesh and bone. You're able to touch him and handle him. And yet, it could pass through shut doors. I, I don't understand. John 20, verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were, think about that, doors are shut, and assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Why does the scripture give us such little detail the saying to us the doors were shut? In other words, the doors were locked. At times, he could not be recognized because the Bible says he withheld his identity. Remember I talked to you just a moment ago about Luke chapter 24 verses 13 to 16. The last verse there says there, uh, I'm, I'm going to pick up reading in verse number 14. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. So he could cover himself some way that he wouldn't be known. And in verse 31 of that same passage of scripture, somehow he was able to dis disappear out of their sight. And their eyes were opened in verse 31. And they knew him. And he vanished out of their sight. Wow. I don't understand. This is beyond anything I believe that we could comprehend. The facts are not always understandable. And yet man has discovered, I think even now, how little he knows about many things. For example, I'm in the church building. 
Okay, this is where we generally gather for church. And this room and the air about me is filled with invisible images. You say, oh yeah, there's angels. No, I'm, no, I'm not talking about angels. There are individuals who are talking and they're moving, they're carrying on. Some are in one scene, some are in another scene, some are wherever. Where are they? Well, they're in the internet. I'm in the internet right now. I am physically in a place, but between my computer and its camera and our nice little Yeti microphone and the camera on my other laptop broadcasting over Facebook, somehow I disappear and I reappear on your screen. Now, if you want to say, I don't understand, then you're with me too. And if we had a television set hooked up to our internet, we might have two or three hundred stations of different programming that's going on, and beside that, music channels. And it's all happening here and now, and it's invisible, and I don't understand it. But I know it's happening. So I'm having trouble with the resurrection. So I'm having trouble with knowing that my Lord is risen from the grave and that he could disappear out of people's sight and that he could pass through doors. Listen, I don't understand, but I believe with all my heart, my soul, and my mind. I'm not looking for a different path to take. I'm going to trust what the Word of God has to say. Now listen. The final thing I want to tell you today is that Jesus Christ's resurrection body is immortal. He cannot die again. Romans chapter 6 verses 9 and 10 says, Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death has no dominion over him. Based upon the fact of that very verse, the Apostle Paul is reaching back to a testimony that Jesus gave to Mary and Martha at Lazarus' gravesite. To that testimony, he said this, I am the resurrection and the life. That's Christ. He said it when he was alive. He went, he died at Calvary's cross, and then he proved his words by his resurrection from the dead. But there's a blessing in these words. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, listen very carefully, though he were dead. People are dead spiritually, though he were dead. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, you have not reached life yet. That is eternal life. You have no assurance that you have life beyond the grave. All that you have to look forward to is a nice funeral, a coffin, a gravesite, and an eternity in hell. But Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life, and though you could, you could pass from death to life by believing on him, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. I wonder today, do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? I wonder today if you've been born again. I wonder today if you need to trust him who to know or write is life eternal. May this time of the year that we call Easter, I prefer to call it Resurrection Sunday. I wonder if this time of the year, would, if you'll believe on the crucified, buried, and risen again, Lord Jesus Christ. The promise of Scripture is that if you believe that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Will you trust him this morning? Will you cry out to him? Will you believe on his name? Let's have a word of prayer together, shall we? Father in heaven, thank you for the time that you've given to us. How we praise you for your kindness and your love. You sent your son to, to die at Calvary, to be buried, and to rise again the third day with power, proving that what 
he did for us at Calvary was effective, was able to save us to the uttermost. We praise you, Father, for the greatness of your care and your love for us. If there's one that needs Christ, bring him to yourself, we pray. Encourage believers in Jesus' name. Amen.